Okay, welcome students to chapter 11, the Congress. In this chapter, we're going to learn a few things about how Congress functions, what is the role of Congress, what does it do. Um, also, just so you know, Congress, when we talk about Congress, Congress is the first branch of government. Now, when we talk about the U.S. Uh, <coughs> governmental system, the Congress is the first branch for a reason, because it was created before the executive branch and the judicial branch. So your second branch of government will be the presidency, the executive branch. And then the third branch of government is your judicial, which is the Supreme Court and your federal lower courts and so on. OK, so um, <clears throat> when we in this chapter, we're going to learn about the role of Congress and what it does and so on and so forth. So here we go. Um, when we talk about the structure and makeup of Congress, we talk about Congress being a bicameral legislature, uh, which Congress consisting of a, a House and a Senate. So bicameral means two, right? The bi means two. It means two House. So there's two House, there's two chambers in our um, system of Congress. You have the House and then you have the Senate. When we talk about the House, the House consists of 435 voting members. Uh, <clears throat> the Senate... Uh, consist of 100 members okay and so and we'll and I'll kind of uh, give you a little more details later on about why that number what that number signifies um, now when we talk about uh, the house representative it's based on apportionment of the of house seats so in the house representative there's 435 seats in in the house right and they represent the districts uh, in each state. So California has 53 House uh, seats, which consist of 53 districts in our in our um, in the state of California. Uh, so we send 53 House members, a delegation of 53 people, to the House of Representatives to represent us. So if you live in um, if you live in Rancho Cucamonga or Fontana, depending on where you live. Your house member could be either Norma Torres or um, Pete Aguilar. So depending on which district you, you sit in and so on and so forth, okay? And um, when we talk about apportionment, it's basically based on the distribution of house seats. And this has to do with, um, again, this has to do with uh, the population. Your house is based on the population. And uh, when we, the forefathers first constructed this this nation, they um, what they were doing was they they came to an impasse. The House representative it was was favored the larger states, which we called the Virginia Plan. Uh, the Senate was based on a smaller, uh, not it's based on favored the smaller states. So in the Senate, that's why each state sends, no matter what the population of that state, it can be three hundred thousand or forty. 40 million it, they're going to send two people to the united states senate so then the california delegation will consist of your two u.s senators and then your 53 house members and so collectively that that's 55 seats right so that means california has a, sends 55 electors to our congress to represent us now, when we reapportion this, this is we do this every ten years, and we call it census. And so, every ten years, the census will uh, they'll take the census you heard, and uh, there'll be questions on the census. Census: How many people are in your house? How many people are adults? How many people are children? Uh, you know what we deem as minor. Uh, it'll be different questions. Now, there's been a, a discussion as of late to put a citizenship question on there. Um, and the Supreme Court has struck that down, asking people if they're citizens or not. Because the goal of the census is just to take, uh, is just, to, it's for numbers. It's, it's to count heads. And it has to do with the apportionment of House seats for the, uh, for the, for the House of Representatives. Um, when we still when we talk about structure and makeup of Congress, representatives are elected by the voters of congressional districts. Again, you can be in the 35th district. I believe um, if you're in Norma Torres's district, it's the 35th district. Um, and so you can depend on where you live. That's who you vote for on your ballot come election day. 
Uh, congressional districts are basically geographical areas, area served by one member of the House of Representatives. Uh, the size of the House, again, is 435 members. Remember that, okay? That's kind of important. Uh, the goal is to have equal representation based on population. So usually House uh, seats, House members have a district of probably about 700, and I'm estimating 750,000 in each district. That's on average, okay? Uh, districts in a given state must contain equal numbers of people. So again, remember, 750,000 people. Uh, districts must be, have continue, uh, the boundaries must be continuous, so they have to be connected. So you can't, you can't uh, have a disconnected district. It has to be connected, even if it's just by one street. It has to be, uh, it must be geographically compact. So you try to, so it, so there's some, there's some uh, Congress people, you have some members of the House who have a district might be no larger than, I would say, five, uh, five mile radius, right? So you have, that would be a district. But then you have some places like, let's, uh, Wyoming only has one House member and they call it a House, at, it's a member at large because they represent the entire state. So, um, so Wyoming will send uh, two U.S. senators and then one House member, to whereas California sends two U.S. senators and 53 House members. So, and it's all based on the population of of each of the state of the state itself. Uh, so, when also when we still talk about the structure and makeup, we're talking about malapportionment. Which basically talks about voting power of the citizens in one district is greater than the voting power of citizens of, an, of another district. And that's true. You know, the smaller your state, the more more say you have in the, in the process. Especially when it comes to uh, running for president. This is why you'll see your uh, pre uh, presidential candidates in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in South Carolina. But not so much in California. And... and it, and it's ba it's due to the fact that they have smaller populations. So because and the small the smaller number, the more vo the more voice you have, and that's 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 just the way it is. Um, in California, because we have so many people, uh, are and it's not that your vote doesn't count. Your vote counts. It's just that your voice is not as loud as somebody in Wyoming or Iowa. Uh, one person, one vote rule requires a congressional districts to have equal populations that so that one person's vote counts as much as another person's vote and again remember 700 about round around 750,000 people uh, when we talk about gerrymandering um, drawing a, a, a legislative districts boundaries to maximize the influence of a certain group or political party both parties do this in California we have uh, Democrats have 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 gerrymandered uh, the Republicans into the smallest number of districts possible, and you see this in Texas with Democrats. You, so, so you see Republicans do this in red states, just like uh, Democrats do it in blue states. Uh, racial gerrymandering led to the creation of, of minority majority districts. Um, when we talk about ma minority majority, minority groups make up majority of the population of a district, and and this has to do with. Um, uh, some people say this has to do with suppressing uh, groups' votes, rights to vote, right? And so when we when we do that, there are limits to rate on limits on racial gerrymandering, according to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that it does violate equal protection clause. So when you gerrymander minorities into or any group of people into a district, you you're only guaranteeing that 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 group will send one Hispanic, for instance, to Congress, one one of that group to Congress, to whereas if you if if you did not gerrymander districts and, and when you gerrymander, the party, that political party that has control doesn't have to work for your vote. That's what that's the problem with gerrymandering. Your candidates don't work they don't they're not working for your vote because they if they gerrymander the district in their favor then they're going to always win no matter what you do right so this is very important that you, that we that when it comes to gerrymandering because gerrymandering is a form of suppressing people's votes and it really does it really it will really um put a group in, uh, into a 
a certain group into a district and and you only see one maybe two of that those people sitting in congress because they have gerrymandered that that group of people into one district when possibly they could be two or three districts right you can send two or three uh hispanic legislate legis legislators to congress because um because you know they went out and campaigned and 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 because the, the districts weren't gerrymandered and also and this does play and and uh, not having a gerrymandered district will uh, make these politicians work for your vote not the other way around when you gerrymander it okay so that's why that's important uh when we talk about gerrymandering the supreme court has ruled that race-based drawing of district lines is unconstitutional and um and and you'll see these type of cases go before the Supreme Court and go before the lower courts and and make their way up to the Supreme Court and and the, and understand when it it can be today this can be considered unconstitutional tomorrow you might get another makeup of the court that says it's it is very constitutional so um, and we'll we'll discuss that at a later date when uh, more information on the uh, Supreme. Uh, this this is a model of, of 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 gerrymandering. If you look at example one, uh, this is a bipartisan gerrymander that projects incumbents of both political parties. So if X is the Democrats and O is the Republicans, you guarantee Democrat they're going to both send an equal amount of number of people to Congress. Now, if you go to example two, if you see the distribution of of the gerrymander, it's an unstable system. So if you look at that example too, this is where politicians have to work for your vote, because if if you're if you're a poli if you're a candidate running and let's again you're the Democrat and you you're it's you you have a little bit of charisma or or you're getting out walking in the precinct knocking on people's doors and talking to people, but the Republican candidate can't be found. Guess what? It might discourage some of the Republicans from voting, or they might vote for the Democratic candidate because they're saying, "Well, I see this person in my community. They're walking the they're walking the precinct. They're introducing themselves." Uh, example three is a classic partisan gerrymandering. Uh, if you look at it, um, X party should carry three districts. So look how they. So what they've done with the O's is they put they put the the O's are guaranteed. At least one seat, because pretty much everybody in their district is. No. The X's, um, if you look at the X's, what the X's have done is made sure they're the majority in the other three districts. And that's that's where you can, uh, where, where the X party will, that's not to quite work as hard, because all they have to do is just, if if you can get X's to be riled up enough, they'll show up and vote for the X party member. And no matter how many of the O's show up in those other three districts, if majority of the X's vote in that election, the X's are going to win. To whereas the O will send only one, at least one member to Congress. Now, um, when we talk about structure, makeup of Congress, um, its representation, uh, function of Congress. Uh, one one way of a representat one function is the trustee view. When we talk about a trustee view, the representative who tries to serve the broad interests of of the entire society. The only problem is when when uh, if I vote for my state senator or my Congress uh, my House member, and they go to Congress and I, all I hear them do, uh, all I hear them do is talk about people in Alabama or. New Hampshire and their, their needs that that's a bit of, for me that's a bit of a problem because I'm a, when you're looking at a trustee view that person is looking at all of society not just the district that they represent that can be a little bit dangerous because um, the if I send you to Congress I expect you to represent me not someone not another person not another group of people in another state uh, when we talk about instructive view uh, delegate view, it's this idea that a representative who uh, deliberately mirrors the views of majority of his or her co constituents. So what they do is they, they poll their constituency and see where the constituency stands on a certain issue. Let's say uh, the Affordable Care Act. If majority of the people in that district are in favor of the Affordable Care Act, 
and you're let's just say your house member is not but they take they they gauge their community and what they do is they vote in favor of it anyway because even if i personally don't agree with it majority of my district says that's what they want and so i'm represent i'm representing the 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 interests of my district not just my own personal interests uh the good thing about this um when when we talk about uh representation uh it earmarks bills to benefit special interests back home. So when you're, so that's literally the view, role of, of of a member of Congress that you send to you, a member of the House that you send to Congress to represent you. Their goal is to get benefits, uh, get, get have some of that money that Congress allots, appropriates to divert it uh, to their to back home to their own districts because it helps with. Um, it might help with uh, unemployment in the district. It might just having funding will uh, create a, a, a pretty good economy in that district. And so uh, then people are going to want to vote for me because they see that I have their, their interests at heart. Um, when we talk about a partisan view, the partisan view, members of Congress are attentive to the wishes of the, of the party leadership. So um, some t some of your members of Congress don't really adhere to what you want any they adhere to the leadership of the party so that, and sometimes you sometimes for some of these people they have to play that game to in order to uh, get benefits you know like earmark funds for their for their districts and uh, and um, other other benefits that are beneficial because you don't, because see, you don't want to have a Congress member go, a House member show up in Congress and not, um, not be able to, uh, not be on committees, not be able to uh, participate uh, on on a committee, have a committee assignment. Because if they can't participate, how are they, how are they getting uh, anything benefits for their for their districts? And so, so it's important that you that you do to an extent play those party politics. But at the same time, participate. Um, uh, do the be in, do your have be an instructed delegate. Find out what your community needs, um, and and it is a bit of a balancing job, a bit of balancing act. And but but it can be done. People have done it, and it gets done. Uh, when we talk about Congress, um, there's qualifications for being members of Congress. Uh, members acquired to be legal residents of the state from which they are elected. So when I sometimes you'll hear people say such and such doesn't live in that district. They have a house in Beverly Hills, even though South LA is uh, where they represent, or Inglewood is where they represent. That is not true. Every member of Congress has to have a residence, it, residency in the district that they represent. And people like I understand people talk because people like to uh, get in, like to. Uh, Act like we know these people personally, <laughs> but but they literally have to be res show proof of residence of the district that they represent. And when you're a member of House, you have to be at least a U.S. citizen for uh, seven years before your election. You have to be 25 years of age, so you can't be 24. You have to be 25. You can be 26, but you but you at least need to be 25. Um, if you're a senator. A U.S. Senator, you uh, you have to be at least a citizen for nine years uh, in order to serve in the U.S. Senate. Uh, you have to be at least 30 years of, of age. And so the member of the president had to be 35. So you see there's kind of like a stair step to be a, to work or uh, to be an elected official on a federal level. Uh, when we talk about uh, congressional elections, the power of incumbency, there's advantages when you're an incumbent. You have that fundraising ability you have congressional franking privileges. So you people, I'm sure you wonder what that is. So um, when we talk about franking privileges, you can, you have, you get to use like, like get information out by using uh, mail. Like you can mail your constituency. Uh, I'm having a town hall this week. Um, please come out and we'll have refreshments. And this is your opportunity to talk to your, uh, your uh, congressman. And so what you, what, you, what you will see is um, even though you can't use your franking privileges for campaign purposes, you're putting your name out there. And if I'm, if I'm having a barbecue at the local downtown park and I'm giving out free hamburgers and hot dogs, all you got to do is show up, then um, it's putting my name out there. And you guys are like, well, that, you know, 
our congressman Callahan is a great guy because you know he listens to us and we had hot dogs and you remember those type of deals and he sends out these uh, every quarter he talks about he sends out these little flyers talking about what he's done this quarter like a state of the district you know he's giving a report to us and letting us know what he's doing so it, it's really important it's really important and good um, also you have a professional staff see when you're an incumbent you already have people working for you because you do a work in Congress so when you're running for re-election you you have a staff on that helps you you know get 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 out the yard signs and all these other flyers these put stickers to put on the back of the car um, also, you have the ability to make laws that benefit your community. Uh, you have access to the media. I mean, you can go on Fox, MSNBC, uh, CNN. Um, there's PBS. I mean, there's th there's places you get to go. Local KCAL nine and KABC and KCBS and all that, all those fun stuff. And then it also gives you name recognition. And a lot of times, a lot of you continue when you do vote you tend to re-elect your house member that was the retention rate of the house is pretty high it's in the 90 percentile so very few people get um leave congress um, in 2018 you did have a lot of people either retire so then you had a lot of new people come in <clears throat> but normally people uh the turnover the turnover rate of of your congr your congress is uh, especially is very low. I mean, so like I said, the turnover rate is uh, less than ten percent because people people hate Congress, but they love their represent they love their House member and they they and and their senators. You guys will keep voting the same people. Look, Diane Feinstein's eighty five years old. She's been there since nineteen ninety two, a, a California senator. You know, and by the time her term is up, she'll be ninety one. You know, so she'll literally retire out of the uh, of the Senate. Um, when we talk about congressional terms, uh, the House members have two years, so every two years they're for re-election. So this is why you're uh, right now we're in the hundred and seventeenth Congress, and uh, and so um, so every Congress. Uh, so every Congress uh, switches over every two years. So even so, and this is because um, this is because your current because uh, so we're, right now we're at the 116th Congress. So excuse me. So right now you're at the 116th Congress. It, it goes from January around January 3rd of 2019 to January 3rd of 2021, and that's what you reelect. That's where you elect your House Speaker and your leadership, the majority party, the minority party. Uh, when we talk about senators, senators serve for six-year terms. So every two years, like one-third of your Senate is up for re-election. And again, I kind of just said uh, congressional sessions are divided into two sessions. Um, right now we're, the, we're in the 116th. Um, and, and this is based on the term of the president. So for each presidential administration, there are two sessions of Congress. So... Um, uh, next, so in 2021, on January 3rd, you will go into the 117th Congress, and in a couple weeks after that, if Donald Trump loses the election, then you will be swearing in a new president. Uh, there are no term limits when we can, when, when it comes to congressional members. So that's again, some of your members have been there a long time. Uh, I just said Diane Feinstein been there since 1992, so there's no congressional term limits. Uh, President can't serve now. The president is term limited, so now he can't serve more than two terms. Okay, so you know, so we don't, and and to change that takes a uh, literally takes a a uh, constitutional amendment to get rid of term limits, and I don't see that happening no time soon. Uh, <clears throat> so again, there's no term limits for uh, members of the Senate and the uh, and the House representatives. Um, Please read your chapters. Uh, it's important that you're reading the chapter because I these lectures are not meant to lecture the entire chapter. Um, thank you and have a great day.